there and the countries are moving deeper into a rut. And of course, you have to remember that a huge part of the deficits that these countries face are cyclical. In other words, they're due to the slowdown in their economies. And so by, by imposing austerity cuts that lower employment, you're actually depriving the government of future revenue streams. So, and you're seeing that in the data. You know, you've got, recently we've got evidence that uh, French retail sales are down, German retail sales are down, so it's affecting not just the southern countries but also the northern ones. Uh, what kind of room is there at this point for countries to pursue growth strategies that don't have to do with, with lending or borrowing but rather have to do with the kind of fundamental changes to the economic structure that make it easier for people to start businesses, easier for people to hire and fire workers and thus take people on, um, easier to enforce contracts, mm -hmm. the kind of basic climate for business that might encourage um, economic growth. Sure, I think those are very important, but the, the problem is that in a panic situation, those reforms aren't likely to have much traction, you know, and, and also you're, you're, you're more likely to devise bad kind of very short-sighted policies in a crisis. So I think without putting a floor on the financial markets, look, when Portugal, when, when Greek one-year bonds are yielding 446%, in other words, that's how much it costs them to borrow money over a one-year period. That is clearly not a scenario in which you can have a reasonable political discussion about how to make your labor markets more competitive. So I think all of those things must come after the panic has abated. And if you look back at the U.S. example, uh, you know, how did we put a floor under, under our sort of economic crash of 2008 and 2009. Well, what the Fed did is it conducted a number of stress tests on the banks. And while this, no, not everyone believed the stress tests, you know, not everyone believed that all the banks were doing fine, even though the Fed said they were. But what they did believe was that in saying that the banks recovered, the Fed was saying, look, we've got the situation. We've, we've got the banking systems back. And that's when people were kind of lured back into the market and stocks started to soar in March 2009. And so without that kind of a floor on European markets, I just don't see how you even get to a discussion about kind of competitiveness policy, because that's the sort of thing that takes years to yield fruit. What's the exposure to countries outside of Europe at this point? Who's, who's got exposure, one, to the, the debt issues, and mm -hmm. then who's got exposure in terms of um, if, you know, the stall, a stalling European economy dragging down exports from a given country that might be going to Europe? Sure. Well, the U.S. is, is very much exposed in, in the broader sense. Uh, you know, officials and, and actually bank CEOs in the U.S. are very quick to point out that we have very little exposure to peripheral European sovereign debt. Now, that's a very narrow uh, perspective on exposure to Europe as a whole because even though they might not hold that much Greek debt, they own a lot of, a lot of U.S. banks own the, the shares and the bonds of European banks. And so they're exposed to Europe that way. And of course, a lot of those banks, a lot of the Northern European banks, the French banks and the German banks, are really holding the bag on the Southern European debt, on the Italian bonds, the Spanish bonds. So our exposure to them comes through that. But then, as you as you intimated, there's a, a broader issue here, which is, you know, we're now seeing numbers from Europe that are essentially recessionary, and we ourselves are experiencing a recovery that's remarkably tepid. So that leaves us kind of on the edge of of an outside shock. And a European recession, depending on its magnitude, could be just that that sort of. We've shock. only got a moment or two left, but what's what's your sense of of countries like? China that have had a, a large um, export market to Europe, are they trying to uh, make any contingencies for how to keep their economic growth going if that market dries up? I think they're trying. There's a sense that China China's kind of moved in both directions. Initially, they were worried about overheating kind of early last year. They tightened monetary policy a little bit, and now they seem to be kind of moving back into easing mode as global growth slows down. But it's kind of impossible to insulate yourself from the two largest economies in the world, those being the, the European Union and the United States. So if there's a simultaneous slowdown in those two, it's hard to see how China can keep its export machine going. Pedro da Costa is economics correspondent for Reuters. Pedro, thanks for joining us. Thanks. This is On the Line, and I'm Eric Felton. How do dictatorships move to democracy? To find out, we talked recently with Sharon Wolchek, who's a professor of international affairs at George Washington University. She's author of Defeating Authoritarian Leaders in Post-Communist Countries. 
So why, after the fall of the Soviet Union, did some countries make a smooth transition to democracy and other countries get captured by these authoritarian regimes? This is a question that my co-author Valerie Bunce of Cornell University explored in some depth prior to our work on the so-called colored revolutions. And she concluded that those that had a lively opposition before the end of communism and in which the opposition won in the first election were more likely to have a straight and relatively smooth, no, not bump free by any means, transition to democracy. So it's really the strength of civil society, even under communism, that played a key role in the availability of dissidents such as the late Václav Havel or Adam Michnik or Lech Wałęsa uh, to take the Polish case, to take the lead in the new circumstances that made a difference. How, how did some countries manage to develop civil society even under repressive governments um, so that there was some infrastructure there to build on once the opportunity for democracy presented itself? This is a, a really interesting question and I think Poland is to some extent the outlier here because the polls began, I won't say the development of civil society, but activism from below in 1956 and then had several waves. Uh, during which civil society and the opposition became more organized, built an alliance with the workers, and eventually came to form Solidarity, the first free trade union in the communist world, which encompassed one out of every three adults in Poland at some point. So that you have the Polish case, which developed out of initial worker activism. In the case of Czechoslovakia and Hungary, although the two were very different countries under communism, you had the development of dissidents who, because of repression in the case of Czechoslovakia and because the regime allowed it in the case of Hungary largely uh, uninterrupted after 1968, uh, developed a core of activists who, although persecuted in one case and ignored in the other, were able to create these small but important communities of independent thinkers and people who were willing to take independent action. And do you see this model and it, its success in this European context having informed to any extent the, the protests that have happened in the Arab world over the last year? This is something that I looked at briefly uh, last summer in trying to trace these influences. And I think the clearest influence is in the case of the young Serb activists, Otpor, who have started a sort of curriculum for democracy building and for nonviolent conflict at the University of Belgrade. And their role in sharing that knowledge with some of the April 6th activists in Egypt. At the same time, those demonstrations were really very, very different in that they didn't center around an election, as all of the cases we examined did. Uh, the catalyst for them in Tunisia was, of course, very different. The spread to Egypt, there was another wave, to be sure, but it was a wave that spread more by power of example and through social media and the Internet, rather than a conscious uh, effort to emulate a strategy from another country or another region. Anything in, in your book, in your research, about how once a democracy does get on its feet and, and pushes out an authoritarian regime, how, how you keep the authoritarian regime from using the electoral process to get back in place and then once again institute the sort of one, one vote, one time uh, strategy of, of, of pushing democracy out, out the window once the authoritarian regime has managed to, to win one election. Most of our work focused on that election that pushed out the semi-authoritarian regime. But we do have a chapter in the book that looks at the day after, as we uh, tended to call this chapter, uh, where we looked at factors that seem to determine whether those countries that had a democratic breakthrough, that was our main interest. Was there a democratic breakthrough or not?
but then we looked at this, and those countries that did have a democratic breakthrough that then made a fairly steady and smooth transition to a relatively well-functioning democracy were those that, again, had strong civil societies uh, that also had strong connections to what we used to call the West, the rest of Europe. They had the incentive of EU membership, NATO membership. They had support from outside. Where those elements were present, you see a fairly quick uh, improvement on all the scores for political and civil liberty, uh, freedom of the opposition, freedom of the media, et cetera. As, as you mentioned earlier, we've seen in, in Russia now um, some finally some protests there uh, in, the, in the face of a system that has not had a lot of back and forth in terms of the powers, but rather um, uh, uh, President Vladimir Putin becoming Prime Minister Vladimir Putin and now being poised to become President Vladimir Putin once again with an election that's that's scheduled there. Um, what's your what's your sense of what needs to happen in Russia at this point to to make a transition to uh, a real functioning democracy? Well, you're right that they've had a very interesting alternation in power, but it's not exactly the kind that theories of dem democracy would accept or predict. Um, I think in the case of Russia, what you have are some of the preconditions that we saw in other countries where efforts to use elections succeeded. You have a great deal of dissatisfaction with the current regime. That was evident in a couple of ways in Putin's declining approval rates, although they're still pretty high compared to those of many leaders in democratic countries. Also, the decline in the share of the vote that his party got in the parliamentary elections and simply the willingness of people in large numbers, in the thousands, to go out into the streets in Russia, something we haven't seen before. So some of the preconditions are there. There's obviously some room to act. There were arrests and detentions, but in the latest rounds we've seen a relatively more tolerant attitude by the regime toward the demonstrators. Uh, there obviously is some room for opposition parties to form and be active. So again, we're talking semi-authoritarian, not completely authoritarian. That's important. The dissatisfaction is there. The protests give uh, some indication that there may be developing this factor that we've identified, as did the activists we talked to, as critical, the sense that change is possible sense of optimism and hope. Although, keep in mind, a demonstration of 50,000 in Moscow is not the same as almost a million in Kyiv in the uh, events of 2004. So in terms of numbers, these are still relatively limited. Uh, but you do have that indication of some greater activism on the part of ordinary Russians. What you don't have is a united opposition, although there are attempts to try to put together some sort of an opposition coalition taking place now. You don't have the same leverage of outside actors, such as all of the organizations in the US and Europe that have provided democracy assistance. Their activities have been curtailed in Russia. The influence of Western governments on the other government, uh, the other leaderships we were talking about was much greater, arguably, not in the case of Milosevic, but that's an exceptional case. Um, obviously, there's no uh, EU or NATO incentive out there for Russia, so it, outside actors have less leverage. Uh, and it's clear that we don't have the same broad massive network of NGO activists throughout the country, although do remember that we had protests in Russia after the flawed December 4th elections in over 80 cities. So they were not confined solely to Moscow and St. Petersburg, although that's where the largest concentration was. So you have some of the preconditions that would say to us it's possible that this model, this strategy of using elections as a focus, because that's the key to the electoral model, that you use these elections as a focus for the expression of mass uh, discontent with the regime.
Some of the conditions are there, not all of them. Sharon Waltrick, Professor of Political Science and International Affairs at George Washington University in Washington, D.C., and co-author of the recent book, Defeating Authoritarian Leaders in Post-Communist Countries. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you. We look forward to hearing from you. Send us your questions or comments at www.voanews.com slash on the line. Thanks so much for tuning in. I hope you'll join us again next week for On the Line. Revenge of the Electric Car is an inside look at an historic shift within the automotive industry, filmed between 2007 and 2010. Director Chris Payne profiles four leaders who take their companies in new directions during a time of economic recession and government bailout of the auto industry. So we thought, well, let's, get a, let's try to get a hall pass and, and see how these guys are doing it. Meet Bob Lutz. Mr. Horsepower. General Motors Vice Chairman Bob Lutz pushes his ailing firm to build an electric car, a program the company had killed in the 1990s. Now GM is back with the Chevy Volt. We were discussing how Toyota was running away with the technological image and the environmental image and so forth. And I said, well, why don't we at least do an electric prototype? The Volt comes to market in December 2010. A month later in Detroit, it is Car of the Year at the North American International Auto Show. How are you doing? Hey, Lynn. How are you doing? Good. How are you? Oddly, there's a chance encounter there between Lutz and dot-com billionaire and startup automotive entrepreneur Elon Musk. <laughs> Musk gambles his fortune on the Tesla Roadster, the first modern electric sports car. At its launch in 2008, he sees a bright future. Tesla is going to put thousands of these cars on the road. You know, until we see every car on the road uh, being electric, uh, you know, we will not stop. So, you know, this is really just the beginning of the beginning. Despite such hopes, the road ahead for Tesla is bumpy and nearly ends in bankruptcy. This is a big strategic move. Another risk taker is Renault Nissan CEO Carlos Ghosn. He banks the company's success on the Nissan Leaf, an all electric mass market vehicle with a 160 kilometer range. We think it's going to be a huge return for the company, huge return. We're going to have to be patient, we're going to have to manage it. It's going to change the face of the company, it's going to change the face of the brand, and it's going to change probably even the image of our industry. So. What is at stake is huge. I've got a Triumph Spitfire, a GT6, and a 67 Camaro. Besides getting to know such industry titans, Payne introduces us to his next-door neighbor, Greg Gadget Abbott. As long as I've known him, he's been converting electric cars. And there's a lot of people doing this, um, not just Gadget, but lots of people like him. So I thought, let's do someone that's not going to wait around for companies to do this. Industry analysts say sales of plug-in electric cars by 2017 will reach 360,000 in the United States and about 1.3 million worldwide. Dave Simison and Betsy Heaney attended a screening of Revenge of the Electric Car in suburban Washington. During the movie, she got her iPad out and she's looking up the cost of a Leaf. And it was like, I think, 25 grand. And well, you know, that's kind of in the range. Because you're going to save money on gas. Well, I tell you what it will take. Because they said in the in the panel afterwards, people buy when they get in. They take a test drive. My husband just has to get in the car, and he will buy it. <laughs> I guarantee you. So that's the difference between having a gas-guzzling car and an electric car. 
filmmaker Chris Payne's Revenge of the Electric Car suggests that early buyers will help write the next chapter in automotive history, a post-gasoline era that could be good news for business, consumers, and the environment. Roseanne Skirbel, VOA News, Washington.